Okay, welcome back. Sometimes when we, when we talk about marriages and family life, there are singles who feel that, why do they have to hear all this information, you know, and maybe those who don't have children and not even thinking about children. You know, we are all part of the Church of Jesus Christ. And as Sarah uh, explained a little bit earlier, we actually, we are a family. We are one house, household of the family of Jesus Christ. And therefore, when you see the children here, you must love the children as if that child is your own child. And when we understand the principles of the word, we will help children, even in the way we speak. We will speak to other people's children according to the principles of God. And we will not make mistakes in saying things to them. Because some children can do naughty things. And um, the way you speak to other people's children must also be in line with the word of God. Let us carry on. We are busy with children's and teenagers' basic needs that must be fulfilled and built within the home. The second one is to belong. And that's also something to feel safe in the family that I belong to. And one of the ways for children to feel belong to a family is when there's a lot of fun in that family, when there's a lot of laughter in that family. And uh, we do that by making memories that will last forever. Do special things with your children. Think about, you know, when will be the best for your family once a week to do something together. When our children were, uh, uh, were small, uh, we would have, let us say, a Saturday. Or later on we had, uh, because they were, when they became older, they were very busy in the evenings, we made it the Thursday afternoon. And then later on when they become so old and so busy with their own lives, we said later on, okay, it will be every Sunday lunch we will eat together. When we have our family time together, then we don't invite anybody else there. And we say that also. We don't invite anybody else. We as parents don't invite somebody. They don't invite friends. But we do a lot of fun things together. And they have that feeling of this is very special because we are together and we do fun things together and it's only us as family that are doing that. Now, because we were so busy at times, even over weekends, uh, when we go on family, we really make it a fun time. We have a lot of laughter, a lot of fun when we go on holiday. We do things during holidays that the children would enjoy. We would say, we have only boys, and what, what will boys like to do? At one stage, we had the boat, and we will go to places, and we will also uh, snorkel. Now, I don't like swimming. I don't like it to put my head under the water, but Sarah taught me to do that. And I swam with him, and we have a lot of fun together. At one stage, we would go on a hike, and um, all the children must go with us. And there was, uh, on the wild coast, there's a cage in the, a cave in the, in the mountain. And uh, that's not my first choice, to sleep in a cave. With only a fire that's burning until one o'clock, and then it's very dark, and you can only hear the sun. It's not my first choice, but I tell you, our children enjoyed it so much. The first day, some of the stuff are clean. The next day, only some of the food are clean. And the third day, everything is full of sand. But you just do it. When you eat, you eat some sand. But I tell you, our children, they enjoyed it so much. When they were small, they would tell you, let's go to the cave. And every time I think, oh no. And then I say, yes, let's go. Let's go and have some fun. And I will have some fun with the children. So sometimes as parents, we do things for our children because we want them to have special, special uh, time with us as a family. Then also for children to feel safe is that according to their age, we must give them more and more independence, give them more space. So I'll explain with a little baby, when they're small, you do everything for them. 
When they cry, you do everything for them. When they, when they grow a little bit older, you know when they're two years old, they want to do their own thing. So you give them a little bit of space. They cannot make good choices when they're two years old. That's why just a little bit of space they will get so that they can feel that their, uh, the, the choice-making thing can develop. So as they grow older, you give them more and more space so that they can become more independent and so that they can become a healthy adult one day. We cannot treat a 16-year-old child like you treat a four-year-old child. We all know that. But we must make a conscious choice to every year to see I give more and more independence to my children. Otherwise, when they, when they are adults and they must get married one day, they're still a child on the inside and they don't know how to make good, a good choices. And we as parents, um, it's like when you have a kite, you know, and you build your own kite and this is now your child. And in the beginning, you take that kite and only a little bit of the rope, you will let it go and more and more as the wind is taking that kite. And you see that kite is going. And then one day, you have to make that choice to let it go. And that's usually when they leave home. So there's always some sort of influence we have. When you have adult children that's still staying with you in the home, you just have home rules, like when you go out, you tell us at what time you're coming back so that we know as parents. If you're not eating dinner with us, you will let us know. So it's more like as a family we have rules, but you don't have the same rules with a teenager that you have with your adult children. So. As the children grow older, we change in, our, in, in, in the rules that we have and the freedom that we give to the children. And that helps them to feel safe. And I think it is possible that adult children, before they get married, I think it's possible that they can get married out of their, out of their parents' home. But only if the parents are um, mature enough to help the children to mature. Because some parents just keep the children for themselves and they cannot mature the adult children and therefore they have to leave the home because they cannot develop. But I think it's possible. Two of our sons, they got married out of our home and uh, our older son, he's in missions, but he still has a, a room at home. When he can come home, you know his stuff is in the home. So even if he get married while he's in missions, it's like getting married out of our out of our home because he's always welcome to come back. You always know there's a room for him, and uh, he has that freedom. And of course, he had a lot of more freedom because he didn't stay with us. But that is to help him to grow to maturity. Then we must have future expectations, and we as parents. We need to live success so that our children can see what success, so that they can have that expectation that one day they will also do that. I like that when Sorrel said, we must enable, God enable us, and we must enable our children, motivate them, help them, talk to them, that they can see what's the, what is their purpose in life, and that we can set them free to reach that. Our children must be fearless. Unfortunately, many parents, the only way that they can get their children to listen to them and to obey them is through fear, to scream and to say, if you don't do this, I will do that to you. You know, children, when they're three years old and they want to touch something and you say no, and they look you in your eyes and they put their finger there, and while they're looking at you, the fingers come closer and closer and closer and you feel like I'm going to kill you. And now you start... Now you start counting. One, two. no man, take the finger away, put him in another place and say, I love you too so much, I'm not going to let you make me angry today. Take him away from the, from the crime scene, you know. And uh, so, because sometimes now there's a power struggle. There might never be a power struggle between you and your child. Remove them away and then there's no power struggle. But uh, just to say, you know, that we must always be the one that feel that we're the one that motivate our children and we are in 
and that we're in control. And our children must be, it must be fearless. There is no fear in love. You know, if you read 1 Corinthians 13, it's saying that love is the thing that must cover always, cover a multitude of sin. Uh, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 3 is saying, if you do a lot of spiritual things, but you don't love, you're nothing. You're nothing. That is what the word is saying. If we don't love our children, if we don't do things out of love. All right, there must be no love, uh, fear. When children are small, please be, uh, listen to your children and what they say when they go to bed. Listen to what they talk about to hear if there's fear in them. And if they have fear, speak to them about the fear. Even if you have to go to the room and check everything and say, there's no nothing. I can see it. You can see it. There's nothing inside, nothing outside. Pray for them and put them in bed. But please remember, if you have fear as a parent, surely your children will also get the fear. So if you fear hojas and you fear the dark and you fear whatever and you say it with your mouth, surely your children will also get that. So make sure that you don't have fear. Then children, small, teenagers, adult children, Married children, all of them want to feel and experience that you accept them just as they are. Even if they do very naughty things, you know, when they become a teenager and you smell smoke or they want to have an earring and you don't want them to have an earring. We do make mistakes, but let us get back to that to say, I love you so much, even with that earring. I will love you. You see, because that makes children feel, whatever I do, my parents will love me. Even when I make the biggest mistakes, they will always love me. And therefore, we must look at our words again. What do we say to our children? It's so easy to say, you're naughty. It's so easy to say, man, you're stupid. We may not say things like that because we're breaking down their uh, self-image. Listen to your words. All right, we must give our children knowledge. There's a lot of things that children need to know, and they need to know it from you as parents. Unfortunately, most children get like uh, knowledge about what sex is and what happened when you make sex and, and the result of sex. They get it from their friends. They say most children, their sex education is from their friends and the TV and other things and not from the parents. And therefore, listen to your children. If you, see, if you watch with your children a movie and you see something in the line of sex, they speak to your children about it. Be open about that. You know, sometimes we feel, how can I talk to my child about sex? They're so small. Well, they, they knew already because they can see it on TV. They listen to their friends. They can see it in magazines. So we cannot say, uh, I feel uncomfortable to speak to my children about sex. Well, they, they heard it already. And therefore, speak to your children about things. I remember our youngest son, I think he was about six years old. He once asked me a question like, will he always also become a grandfather one day? And I said, yes. And then he said, must I also go to army? And then I realized there's more to the question. And he said, you know, what do you think happened to grandpas and what happened with men going to the army? And he said to me, well, they die. So it was an opportunity for me to explain to him what death is about, to say that we don't die because in Christ we never die. It's just this body that will die. And uh, many, many years after that, when my father died, and that's about 10 years ago, uh, I was crying a lot, and he asked me, why are you crying? I said, well, I'm now without a daddy and whatever. And he said to me, but he's still alive. It's only his body. You see, and now the concept as a small child was the, wrong, was the right concept, and now he has no fear for death. And actually in our home, there's no fear for death because we know we live forever. But if you think how many people fear death, but because nobody ever spoke to me about death. So we must give them truth about life. Um, we must also give them the truth about God, the character of God. You know, many times the things that's coming out of our mouth in a crisis, it's not the character of God. It's not trusting God. 
And therefore, the truth we give, we must also love that truth. And then discipline. Now, early this year, uh, w while we did that, um, we spoke about the identity and the restoration of our identity. I also spoke about discipline, and I gave you the, the difference between discipline and to punish a child. To remember, punish is to get back at somebody. You did something, so I will get back to you, and it's out of anger. Well, discipline is... I will help you to become like Christ. That's why we disciple somebody, is become more like Christ. And therefore, when somebody is disobedient, if we think in our relationship with God, there's always some pain. So when our children are disobedient, there must also be pain. Now, in the beginning, when Saul spoke, he said it's about a relationship. Now, God wants us to have a relationship with him. Now, that's this, because that's the primarily thing that we must do. Out of us, our relationship with God, we will obey God. So that's what we want with our children. We want a relationship with our children, and out of the relationship, they will obey us. Let us take an example. When children are small and they have to pack up the toys, you help them, you, you, they, they see how you do it, and you do it with them. So there's a relationship there, and when they grow older, later on, you can just say, pick up the toys, and they just do it. Why? It's out of the relationship that they obey you. It's not because you say, if you don't pick up the toys, I will whatever to you. You see, not out of that relationship but, uh, 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 to be rigid. It's out of a relationship of lo love that we do that. Just to say discipline, uh, when children are small, the pain is more physical and the, and the way of, you know, when they're small and they touch something and you sit and, or you took them away and they don't listen, is to just to take them very lightly on the hand, not, not to harm them, but just for them to say, I said so, and there's pain in that. Later when they get, uh, when they, especially if you're four years old, that's the, that's the time like that uh, hiding works very well with them, but with rules, you know, you speak to them, you tell them what you said, what's the rules, what you want them to do, what not, if you do that again, then mom is going to give you hiding. Now, before we get to that, when children are small, you have to distinguish between childlike mistakes and rebellion. So if a child walks with a glass the first time and the glass and he falls and the glass broke, you give him the rule. You might never walk with a glass, even if he's just walking with a glass and it didn't break, to tell him, you might not walk with a glass. That's the rule. I don't want you to do that. So the second time he's doing that, you take the glass out of his hand and say, remember I said you might not do that. And if you do that again, then I'm going to give you a hiding and it will be two strokes. You tell him exactly what's going to happen. And when he does that again, then you do what you say to him. Hiding for little children, we took our children to our room because uh, uh, hiding for us was part of love. It wasn't a thing that we do because some people say, don't do it in your bedroom because your bedroom is a place of safety and love. Well, hiding is also love and safety. I don't hate my child. I give him hiding because I love him. So we would usually take them and uh, we had the plank that we called Gehoorzaamheid, obedience, and we would say, okay, we said two strokes, and we explained the whole thing, and he must say to us, I'm very sorry, and I say, I forgive you, and I will never think about this again, but I give him two strokes. Now he must bend properly. We tell him, we aim for the bokies, you know, to do it on the right place, and, uh, and if they vrimel or they scream, we say, no, 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 it's not counting now. You might not scream, that's rebellion. You might cry because it's painful, that's the idea. But you might not scream, and you might cry afterwards. You don't cry before the time because there's no pain yet. So you give good rules, and you speak to them, and they must understand that. So you aim for the right place, and uh, if they vrimel and they move and it's on the legs, you say, no, I didn't aim for the legs, so it's not counting. We, we start all over again. And you keep... Keep to your rules when they're small. And I tell you, that obedience thing in that do a lot of change in their life. But it's only when they're small. So and afterwards, you pick them up, you love them, you tell them, I love you so much. I had to give you this hiding because you didn't listen to me. Mommy forgives you, and I will never think about this again. 
so we make jokes and when we get out of the room we all smile. When he does that same thing again, I don't remind him of the past. I just said, do you remember what's the rule? You may not walk with a glass. So when he ignores me, we go back and we do the whole thing again. But I don't remind him of the past because God is not doing that. When something is part of the past, it's part of the past. But you can warn and say, if you do this again, I will give you a hiding. Then you can remind him of that. But, and then the other thing is, th because I'm closing with discipline, is that if you scream at a child, that's the discipline. So you cannot scream and give a hiding. So when a child does something wrong, you talk normally, say, no, 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 that's not our rule. We spoke many times about it. And you have a good laugh as you come. He's coming to give you a hiding, or let us talk about the consequences. You know, when he's a teenager, you say, there's consequences for disobedience or whatever, and then we, there's a discipline. But the moment you scream, you discipline the child already. And we don't discipline a child twice. So just to help you not to scream on your, at your children, because that was the discipline already. And then just when the children get older, we make use of consequences, logic consequences, or we speak about them and say, what's the consequences? Like, I take your cell phone away, or whatever we do. Please just remember, whatever discipline you do must be, it must weigh with a thing that they did wrong. Like, if, you're, if your child is uh, using foul language, you don't, what is walk? Ground, you don't ground your child for one wrong word for a month. You see, because then you do it out of anger. So you must see what, what they do wrong must be way out with the discipline. And then lastly, I want to talk to you about, oh yeah, that's not three, about authority. Children must see authority in our lives. In what, this is one of the biggest thing, things I think that lack in many, many houses, and that is authority. And to start with authority is that Children must see authority and God of God in my life, that I obey God, that I honor God. And we talk a lot in our congregation about to align with authority. That means that we must have a spiritual father and that I must be a son of God to become a son of a spiritual father so that I can become a father again. So that authority alignment, all of us must do that. It's also for women. And then the children must hear how we honor authority and actually how we honor anybody. How do we honor God? How we love God? When we're in the crisis, do we blame God for our mistakes? Do we blame God because uh, something went wrong with our car? Then we don't honor God. Do we honor our spiritual leaders with our mouth? Do we honor the teachers in school? Now, I was also a teacher for many years, and uh, I quickly could see when parents come for a parents' evening if they honor authority. You know, the moment a parent would come to me and say, you know, we want to so I want to sort out this thing with you about my child. Then I always said, said to a parent, okay, now let us get it right. There's your child, you're not there and I'm here. There's your child, and both of them stand on the same side. If you think I'm opposite your child, then we cannot talk. We stand on the same side. You see, because the moment parents see you as the enemy, that's why the children will not honor our parents. And we all have to get that thing right in our minds. We have to honor other people. We have to honor our president and our country. Although we disagree with a lot of things that he's doing, we disagree with each other, but that doesn't mean that I must dishonor you. We must uh, honor the police in our country. We must honor other people, other Christians. Our children must hear it out of our mouths, how we honor people. We must honor people that looks differently. You know, when, when we hear over the news about things that's done to people of other cultures, immediately I think, it's the parents' fault that people dishonor people that doesn't look the same as they. When there's racism, and even at the moment we have the racism between 
different uh, African ethnic groups, it's parents, parents that did that to their children. Let's check what we say, the words that's coming out of our mouths. Let us, let us honor other people. Let's get to worship. Are you really totally dependent on God? Do you really trust God with everything in your life? Can your children hear that? When, when you as a family together, do they hear that you say, I love the Lord so much? Can you, did your children ever see you praying, holding hands together with a family, praying together, trusting God? I think on Sunday, Sarah said that, what do you say to your children if they want something and don't have money? Do you tell the children, we don't have money for that? That's, there's no faith in that, but to say, we don't have that money yet. If you would like to have that thing, I will pray with you that God will provide the money for that. So you put faith into your child's life and say, let's pray together. If you think it's not the right thing for the right time, then you can have a discussion around that and say, let us see, why do you want this? Is this the right time to have that? But not to speak faithless that we don't have faith. Okay, relationships. Can, people, can your children see that you tolerate other people and that you love other people? Or do you skunder, gossip about other people? We always sit on Sunday afternoons, they didn't eat the lamb, they ate the pastor. So everybody was gossiping about the pastor. Do you use the time when you eat together to gossip about other people? We must love each other intensely. The most important one is God. Children must see you, you love God. And secondly, they must see you love your spouse. They must see it. They must experience that. And then just a word to those of you who are single, who's uh, divorced. And you, and you must do the thing alone with your children. God is your husband and he will help you for everything. Secondly, that's why you in this family or where you are in the family, the Church of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people that love you and will really help you. Even if there's a, there's a, 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 a male from a husband or a male side that somebody must help you. Look in your family. Maybe your own father or uncle will help you with that. And then lastly for the singles, although you had a good reason to get divorced, honor the other person. Honor your ex-spouse. Not by saying what that person is doing is right, because if it's wrong according to the word of God, that's the principle, but honor him in front of your children. Because if you honor that person, it will help your child to grow into that relationship also and to understand honoring better. According to Christian values, it's on that page there, which govern my life. My most important reason for loving is to get the baton, the gospel, safely in the hands of my children. My number one responsibility is evangelize my own children. Your son is never too old to hear you say, I love you and I'm proud of the man you've become. Um, our children are never too old to kiss them, to hug them, never too old. When they're small, kiss them, hug them. When they grow up, kiss them, hug them. When, when, you have, when your daughters grow up and they become teenagers, fathers, get that daughter in your arms, kiss her, hug her, even if you feel that your daughter is growing in an adult. It's your daughter, you healthy inside. If you're a healthy diet and you're a healthy family, it's very important for a teenager daughter to know that my father can, can hug me very closely because he accepts me as I am. Many, many, many teenage daughters felt there's something wrong with their body because their father doesn't want to hug them anymore. I'm talking about healthy families. You see, we're always so aware of the wrong things that can happen in the family. And that's why our children are not healthy. Because we're afraid that if my husband sees my, my little girl of four years old naked, 
it's wrong. What's wrong? It's your child. That, 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 that child is coming out of your lines. It's your, it's your child. But it must be a healthy family, what I'm talking about. Just to help you. And your, and your adult sons also. Hug them, love them. It's your child. You know, when my sons grew up, and they made me angry. I said to them, you know, I made you. You're coming out of me. You listen to me. I'm the mummy. You see, and that's actually a way of them to realize she's still my mummy. I'm in no competition with my sons or their girlfriends. I'm the mummy. I tell them. I, I stay the mummy. When you get a girlfriend, she's the girlfriend. I'm the mummy. So just help your children the whole time. You understand what's your place. I'm not in competition with anybody. The only competition I have is my own husband. You see. And, uh, and my children know that. He's the most important person. I love them very much. But he's number one in my life in relationships. All right. On the day that my daughter was born, I was too naive to realize that I was embarking on the most important assignment of my life and that if I failed as a father, all my other achievements would somehow be diminished. There's something we say a lot of times. We say, no success out of your family life, your home, will ever make up for failure inside. So if you're a failure as a father, failure as a mother, failure in your, in your, in your family, it doesn't matter how much success you have outside. It's not really counting. Because one day when you die, you're not going to say, I'm so glad I had so much success outside. Then you say, I wish I had more time with my loved ones. Thank you very much, Sarah will help you to do something now. <laughs> yes, now we are challenged. We are the image of God for a purpose and reason is so everything that's in heaven must come to earth and we are reflecting God on earth and he's using parents and he's using a church. One of the great messages, that, what we call apostolic doctrine that is prominent at the moment is we call a household of God. God is building a family. So the principles we are talking about, your family must be in the family of God. Every church should have all these qualities inside, and your family should be like that. So it's my endeavor and my purpose and to, to help you in your household and in this big household and those who are not in this one, in what wherever you are, that you can enjoy in the, the household of God. All the qualities, covenant, grace, empowerment, intimacy should be there prominent and for those that, like Tisa said who are single or are hoping and planning and praying for a spouse and a family trust God that you will have a heavenly family on earth and if you are coming out of one that was a failure I mean you are cutting that and you are a new generation you start a new season you cut that you don't have to be like your family you are a new creation you start a new family and your generation become people of blessings and, and that's have influence. So uh, in your groups, in the last couple of minutes, uh, pray for one another, especially about what we've said now, you know, about building a family, being coming that. And if there's couples in the groups or people who are married, uh, pray for them specifically about their marriage and their family. If they're single people, pray for them about their future. In, in terms of that, let's be sensitive and for some minutes let's minister to one another and speak prophetically and life and wisdom and, and motivation into the lives of one another about what God wants to do for you in the near future. Before you go home, God bless you, love you, see you soon again.